Alright, good afternoon guys. So it's Geekonomics here. It is the 18th of September and just bringing you something a little bit different today. I've been working with my upper six students and we're putting together personal statements at the moment. And one of the things which has been, um, I wouldn't say problematic, but slightly difficult is what literature should I be reading? What should I be referencing in my personal statement? And if I get an interview at a university, what potentially could I talk about? So I thought I would bring you just a little bit uh, in the next few weeks on some of the economic books, or certainly book that I'm reading at the moment. And hopefully maybe this might uh, inspire you to pick this up and you might think, oh well, maybe I'll have a little read of that because were I to get an interview at university, then this is something that I could talk about. And I could also perhaps reference some of these books and some of these quotations from these eminent professors who are writing these books. I could reference that in my personal statement. And obviously that shows reading around the subject and it shows that little bit more interest than simply subscribing to The Economist or reading The Sunday Times or The Economics Today, all of which are not to be um, are not to be missed, of course, but this just shows that you go in that little bit further to the nth degree in that respect. So the book I'm reading at the moment just started this one. Uh, it's by Joseph Stiglitz. I hope you can see that. Um, and it is entitled The Euro and Its Threat to the Future of Europe. I've been reading uh, a few books on this theme. I've got another one over here, uh, Roger Bootle, uh, The Trouble with Europe. That's a good one to read as well. But this one by Joseph Stiglitz, what I'd like to do maybe in the next few weeks is just bring you a little chapter by chapter breakdown of what Stiglitz says in this particular book. So, if I may, let me just tell you um, a little bit of the background to this book. So you'll be aware, of course, that in 2008 was the, uh, the outbreak of the financial crisis. And really, Joseph Stiglitz says that, it, in, in his book, he says that from that financial crisis in 2008, that morphed into um, the Euro crisis that is still, unfortunately, um, affecting so many of the countries within the EU who are using the Euro, not necessarily the EU, but the Eurozone countries. And they're all affected by a lot of economic stagnation, there's still an enormous amount of problems with debt and so on. Now the Euro of course was hailed by its architects as one method by which we could bring Europe together and it would create great prosperity. So there would be that togetherness and prosperity. But actually, Joseph Stiglitz, in, in his book, he goes on to outline and to argue that actually um, the Euro project has done and is doing quite the opposite to that. And in this book, he tries to explain whether or not this Euro project could be saved. And actually, it's quite a positive, quite an uplifting book. Uh, when you get towards the end of it, with regard to the fact that he's saying that actually it can be saved, and there are three, three he, he identifies three ways in which it can be saved. So I just want to talk to you today about the preface of this book. It's only 10 pages or something like that. I just want to give you a little bit of flavour as to what Stiglitz is saying in that. So he starts off by setting the scene and really goes into um, the details of some of the more depressing aspects of what's going on within the Eurozone. So he talks about Greece being in depression, half of its youth unemployed in Greece. He talks about the fact that far-right groups are in the, in the sort of political vacuum that, that has arisen. Far-right groups are emerging and filling that vacuum, particularly in France and Spain. He talks about the fact that large parts of Europe, similar to, I guess, what, what's happened in Japan, large parts of Europe are facing a lost decade in terms of GDP growth, simply hasn't moved, it, is, it, is, it has become stagnant in that respect. And finally settles on a little discussion about Spain and the massive youth unemployment there. One in two youths, youths are unemployed in Spain, and indeed, I guess that would be even more had it not been possible for people 
within the European Union and for youth uh, youths in Europe t to move out of Spain and to go and seek work elsewhere. So that, that whole uh, ability to migrate in that respect is very important for them. Now he sets out uh, the scene here about Joseph Stiglitz by saying that this is totally counter to uh, a f another Nobel Prize winning economist, Joseph Stiglitz, a Nobel Prize winner, but he also references Robert Lucas in 2003 when he addressed the American Economic Congress or Forum or something like that. And he says this, he said, this is Robert Lucas speaking, said, the central problem of depression prevention has been solved. That was back in 2003. Now, if you look what's happened after 2003, clearly that is not the case. And Stiglitz argues that really the reason that this European Eurozone project has failed is because the economic uh, policies which have been followed have not been matched and mirrored by uh, political institutions which ought to have been set up in order to keep this project on the road. Stiglitz argues that currency pegs uh, as they're called where one currency is pegged against another or to a commodity as has been the case in the past that inherently if you look back at over economic history and some of you will do economic history at university um, thinking back to the gold standard and so on in America in the late 19th century um, where currency pegs are renowned for um, leading to great recessions and depressions. So he does reference actually the, the gold standard in the late 19th century and as gold became scarce then even the very basic necessities became very cheap in America and it meant that American farmers at the time were unable to service their debts and then that led to recession and prolonged depression. Um, and the same is true if we consider even back to the early 20th century and the Great Depression. Countries which were tied into the gold standard and pegged uh, into that system, countries which came out of that system early recovered much more quickly than countries which didn't. And Stiglitz says, isn't it, you know, he's thinking, well, isn't it ironic that these countries, which um, the, the leaders of Germany, France, and so on and so forth, they've all looked back at economic history, and they're all aware of this, and yet despite this, in spite of it, they have pressed on with the Euro project. So you'll know there are 28 nations in the European Union, 19 of those now use the Euro. And that this whole Euro project is quite, it's quite new obviously. Um, started back with the Maastricht Treaty in the early 1990s, so when I was doing my A-levels, um, so the topic material that we were looking at in those days, back in the day, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the topic material was the Maastricht Treaty. And of course, uh, we were a part of the exchange rate mechanism in the early 1990s and where we were part of this PEG system um, and we crashed out of it. Unfortunately, we were returned to a floating exchange rate system. Um, you can read up on that, obviously. Norman Lamont, the Chancellor at the time, pulled us out. And probably that's one, been one of the best things that we've actually done in that respect. But anyway, Euro notes and coin have only actually been circulating since 2002. And Stiglitz, I mean, he's a man of vast experience. He worked on the North American Free Trade Agreement uh, back in the early 1990s, it was introduced in 94. So that was between Canada, Mexico, and the United States. And even, he's writing this book, he says that even back then, he, he, he was, um, it became obvious to him that this whole notion of a quote unquote a free trade area is actually a deceptive term in his eyes and there's no such thing as free trade and really these trade agreements generally speaking the people who put them together engineer them so that they are beneficial to themselves uh, rather than to anybody else um, and, and the same is true of various agreements which are uh, being implemented at the moment so you've got the there are trade agreements being negotiated across the Pacific and the Atlantic. So you've got the um, the the TIP, which is the Transatlantic Transatlantic Trade and Partnership, Trade and Investment Partnership, and you've got the uh, TPP, which is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. 
And again, these free trade agreements are being negotiated behind closed doors, probably to the benefit of the people who are actually negotiating them. He also references the World Bank in this introduction. He talks about the, um, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and makes a little bit of a alludes to the whole notion of government failure. So you'll be familiar, I'm sure, with the, the notion of uh, market failure, whereby uh, the markets fail. Um, you know, Adam Smith's invisible hand, whereby economies are automatically, instantaneously drawn back to their socially uh, optimum position because markets are clever and markets clear and economic agents are clever and they're sharp and they're on the ball. And Stiglitz says that this is all an illusion. And of course, if you look how long it's taken economies and even our own economy to recover from the Great Recession, as it was called, uh, from 2008 onward, we're talking 50 plus months. That is not an instantaneous reaction and an instantaneous recovery, isn't it? And what happens? It required significant stimulus from not only the government and also central banks within Europe and the Eurozone. So uh, the whole notion of these, um, uh, this instantaneous correction it is really is a bit of a myth. We've been talking about this in class, haven't we, in the last week or so. But he, he talks about the International Monetary Fund and, for example, what they did to the Greek economy. So, Greek economy enormously in debt. So, what, what did they need? Well, they needed sort of growth strategies to get them going to generate tax revenue to pay down their debts. What did the International Monetary, uh, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund do? They imposed enormous austerity on them, uh, counterintuitive policy, really and it has only served to exacerbate rather than improve the problem. Stiglitz, and I think this is a really interesting point in the preface of the book, he, he talks about his own country um, and uh, the, Amer the United States economy in particular, and talking about the fact that there's really too much emphasis when we're talking about uh, economies and growth and so on, there's too much emphasis on GDP growth. Referencing the American economy, which has grown for the last 30 years, but really to the detriment of the many and to the benefit of the few. The rich have really have got much richer. Those of you who have looked at income inequality and the Gini uh, coefficient and so on and the Lorenz curve, you'll, you'll know about these terms and if you don't know about them, maybe you should look them up. But in terms of income distribution, it's a very, it's a fine balancing act between improving GDP but forsaking uh, all of these other things and so Stiglitz argues that there's a much wider moral aspect to, to, to growth in an economy rather than the simple focus on GDP growth, GDP growth, GDP growth all the time. And then finally, it, as if to prove a point, he talks about you know German GDP in 2010 was 10 times that of the Greeks, now it's 15, 16 times. Well, wh where's the fairness in that? So, simply in the preface, I would sum up by saying that Stiglitz is arguing that the current system for the Euro is not viable and it is not sustainable in the long run. And in the next chapters of the book, he will outline the key problems, but also provide an uplifting solution at the end. So... I hope maybe you might think to yourselves, oh, that sounds quite interesting, and particularly for university and so on. And if you've any books that you're reading, you think, oh, you know, here's a good one, get this on your recommended reading list, Economics, then do message me by all means and get in touch. So uh, that's it for today, folks. Bye for now, and uh, see you again in due course.